Okay, um, welcome. I'll be talking about uh, MBJS. <coughs> um, I'll label the talk and application framework for the future. Um, I'm. Uh, my name is uh, Joachim Shaya. Um, I'll be um, doing some uh, live coding, and I'll be posting the code up on GitHub. So I'll be tweeting out the URL for that uh, when we're done. So, just uh, quickly about me. Um, I run a sort of a singleton corporation, so it's a company with one employee. So I work as an independent consultant and a course instructor. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> and um, I'm building an application uh, performance tool called the Montric, which is fully open source. I'm also the author of Embedded in Action, uh, which is, I guess, the primary reason why I'm here. And I'm also running the Emberfest conference. Uh, we ran it for, uh, first time last year in uh, Munich. Uh, we had we're just a bit shy of a hundred people. Uh, so this year we we chose uh, sunny Barcelona, uh, and we're aiming for to get about two hundred people to join us there. So what is Ember? Uh, Ember is uh, a single page application framework. It's built around uh, the MVC pattern, and is uh, among the uh, SPA frameworks, it has the strongest MVC pattern uh, built in. Uh, so I try to sort of lay out where Ember.js fits. Uh, so on the uh, left hand side, you have the traditional websites where everything is a request and everything comes as a response and you re render the whole page for, for everything. Uh, and on the right, you have a more application type style web uh, sites, so web apps. And it's really in, uh, in this area here where Ember.js is built to work. So if you remember back to the 90s or early 2000s, this was the way we built web pages. Uh, so for every request or every action the user performed, you would query the server and you would get the result back and you would re-render the whole page. Uh, and that was fine when, uh, when web pages were just information and it was just markup. There was no, nothing special going on. Um, There's no added functionality uh, above that. Um, but then, as applications started to get more complex, uh, we were still unable to put functionality in the, on the client. So we had to sort of uh, adapt the, the MVC um, pattern uh, into something else like this. And this is the, I think this is the Sun MVC pattern that they implemented in there uh, in Java or JSP. So, while it's fully dynamic on the server side, it has this uh, sort of Chinese wall between the server and the client, and there's no dynamicity between the server and the client. So then we sort of got a web 2.0 with Ajax, and they promised us that we would be able to <laughs> request a full web page on the initial requ requests, and then for any other requests, we would only get partial web page updates. So we will say we want this div to be updated and the server would generate that HTML and pass it on and we would only uh, replace that part of the DOM. And while that's a good idea, generally what we instead got was that we seldom want to re-render just a single element. We want to say you add an item to a shopping cart, you want to update the, the item itself and you want to update this, the shopping cart and you may maybe have an overview at the top, you want to update that as well. And it's really difficult on the server when a request comes in to know which elements do you actually need to re-render on the client. Uh, so what they did instead, most uh, frameworks that deal, dealt with Ajax, was that they would ship the whole web page back anyways and then the client uh, scripts on your page would find the elements with correct IDs and swap them out. So while you didn't reload the whole uh, application in the browser, you would still do the same amount of work for each request on the server. The downside is that now you do 10 times as many requests because you, for, for every little action the user does, you have to re-render the whole page or on the server. So that's sort of where, we, where single page applications comes in uh, and it tries to solve this problem in a different way. So we would request the full website in the initial requests, and after that, the only thing that goes over the wire is data. There's no markup, there's no scripts, and there's no CSS uh, going over the wire at all after the, the application is loaded. 
So Ember has a strong MVC pattern, and it enriches each of the layers of the MVC pattern with um, sort of a microlibrary uh, in itself. So in the view, uh, you have both views that are JavaScript objects, and you have templates which are, by default, they're handlebars, and you can, if you want to, you can swap out handlebars with uh, another templating library, but I've, I haven't seen that done in any Ember application at all. And I think the reason for that is that, uh, well, first, handlebars is built by the same people that built Ember, and secondly, it works, it, it provides the functionality that you need. And on the controller, or on the C part of the MVC pattern, uh, you have the controllers, which are also JavaScript objects, and in addition to that, you have a router. And a router is just a way to hierarchical structure uh, your application so that um, all the paths that your user can navigate within your application is clean it, clearly defined up front. Uh, and that also controls the URLs that your application has, uh, and that makes your a single page application bookmarkable, even though it's a single page application. Uh, and out of the box, Ember uh, ships, doesn't ship with a model concept, um, but uh, Ember Data, which is the uh, persistent framework that the, the Ember core team uh, develops, <coughs> and which is the model layer with um, a proper model uh, pattern. So in the code later, we'll be using Ember and Ember Data, uh, so we can see how that works. So the structure of an Ember app, uh, if you're used to server-side generating your websites, uh, there's a lot of concepts that are new or different than what you're used to. So generally, when an event happens in Ember, it, uh, a user will trigger an event uh, on a view. Uh, and that view will call on the controller or the router and perform an action. Uh, and that action will uh, update the model or ask the model layer for data. And then most persistent frameworks for Ember uh, has the synch asynchronous part here. So what will happen here is that we will generate dummy objects right away and return them back after the application via bindings and observers uh, synchronously, while asynchronously going to the server to fetch that, da that data. And then this process here goes along on its own and calls the server, uh, gets the data over JSON or REST or another frame, uh, another XML or w what you set up for your application. And then when that data comes back up and updates the model, we will update the very same objects uh, and that will propagate up to the views automatically via on the same bindings and observers uh, that you have. So while while this um, sort of this structure here uh, needs to be in place, you don't need to start it at at, the, at C1 here. You can start it wherever, but you have to move in the right direction. And Ember helps you with ensuring that you actually follow uh, follow that path. So. This model is fully dynamic, because everything is on the client. Uh, and the beauty of this model is that the application and the user state, it's on the client side. It's not on half on the client, half on the server. You don't have to synchronize them. And that means that the server does what the server does, which is it serves data. And the application does what the application does, it serves the user. Uh, and this application is a lot easier to scale out horizontally because there's no uh, shared state between the client and the server. So I'll quickly go through the router before we, uh, we're going to dive into uh, the code. And I'll try to explain the concepts um, as, we, uh, as we write them in the code. So the router is a hierarchical structure. Uh, and it can have a route can either be a resource, which comes from Race, uh, rails, uh, the naming comes from Rails. So a resource is a route that can have sub-routes. And a route is a route that cannot. That's the main difference. Uh, and each route has uh, a URL. And the complete URL of your route is devised from, uh, it starts at the very top route, and then it goes the full URL will be slash customer slash edit. 
So we'll be building a simple CRUD application. Um, and if you were to split this application up in a server-side framework, uh, you'd probably do something like this. Okay, you have a header, you have an area on the right, left there that's, uh, where you have buckets. In the middle you have a list of the keys that are in a bucket, and on the far right you have the keys. Uh, but in Ember you'd structure it like that. So you have an application route that encompasses your whole application, and that has a single subroute called buckets, which has a single subroute called buckets, and that has a single uh, subroute called key. So this is the way we'll uh, model that up in Ember. So LDBB is just the name of the application. It can be app or it can be any, anything you choose. Uh, and we'll go through uh, the meaning here uh, when we code it in. But basically it says, if you look at the second line, uh, you have a resource. The name of that resource is buckets. The path of that URL, uh, is the URL that that bucket is going to uh, belong to. And then the function is uh, any subroutes are defined within that function, the third parameter. Um, and by default, Ember will generate a lot of code for you. So if you have a, uh, um, sorry, um, a route called buckets, it will generate default, a default template called buckets, a default view called buckets view, a default controller called buckets controller, a default route called buckets route, as well as <coughs> it'll imply that you have a model called buckets. And you can override any of these if you want. So if you need any special behavior, you override uh, the correct class or the, uh, the correct template in order to inject your own functionality. Um, yeah, so this goes through the same thing. Um, this is also the bucket, it's also a resource, so it has the same uh, naming convention. The only difference is with the routes. And since the route is a leaf node, uh, the naming of uh, the classes are derived from the, uh, from the closest resource and then the name of the route you're in. So that for the key route here, all of the classes will be named bucket key because it belong to, belongs to the bucket resource. Uh, and I have a simple server-side um, implementation that we won't be looking at at all, but it has uh, this JSON uh, data structure or data uh, hash that uh, is tailored into so that Ember data can understand it without uh, having to uh, tell Ember data how to find the data. So if I ask for JSON buckets, uh, it will return an array of buckets uh, with the ID of buckets. And this simply has an ID and a list of keys. And the list of keys here are strings, and the, they are the IDs for the actual key objects that we're gonna... Um, so we're gonna have a, a relationship between the buckets and the keys. And we can also ask for a single bucket, and in that case we will return an object instead of an array, and it will be, be labeled buckets instead of buckets. And same for keys. So we can ask for a key, and then we'll, it'll return an object with that, um, with a name, uh, with a ID or with the name key. Uh, and we can also ask for multiple keys, and it'll, in that case it'll return an array. So we're going to do some live coding. And uh, in order for this to work, uh, you have to participate somewhat. So while I type, I will make mistakes. I will make typos. So if I don't spot them, just name, call them out immediately, or if you see them. And I promise I won't bite. So uh, we'll just go through the, what's set up already. It's a fairly empty application. I've set up Grunt as the build tool. Uh, so I have a uh, package.json file, which has the name of my application, which I called LDBB, uh, which is hard to pronounce, I don't know why I chose that name. <laughs> uh, and it has the version of the application I'm, I'm building, as well as the dependencies that Grunt has. So these are all the dependencies that I need for being able to build and assemble my Ember application. Um, in addition, I have a Grunt file, which will go through and uh, set up the tasks that I need in order to build the application. Uh, so I've set up concatenation, so that it'll find all my JavaScript file and concatenate them into a single file. Uh, and it will also uh, pre-compile all my handlebars templates, so that uh, they will all be compiled into a single uh, JavaScript file. 
uh, and then it will run uglify to minify the code uh, for production. Uh, we won't actually be using the minified version of this because it's impossible to debug in if you make a mistake if the code you have in your browser is minified. Uh, but the important part here is that I've set up uh, the watch plugin. So that means whenever I make a change to my files, uh, Grunt will uh, trigger a build so that I can make a change in my file and go back to the browser and just refresh and it'll be updated without me having to go into the command line and type Grunt. So there's two uh, tasks. There's a dist task, which will run all of the tasks that we set up. And there's a default task, which will only run the watch. And that will compile my templates and concatenate into a single file. Other than that, there's the tasks. Uh, I won't go through them, but that is, there's a task for to uh, configure each grunt module. Uh, and then I have a few libraries. I have Bootstrap, uh, Twitter Bootstrap, uh, version 1.3 of Ember, which is the uh, latest version. Uh, the beta 5 of Ember Data, which is also the latest version, as well as the latest handl handlebars and jQuery uh, 1. Uh, and then I have um, a CSS file, uh, just to make it look a little bit more pretty. Uh, I won't be writing any CSS file, because that's I find that's a bad idea to do while live coding. Um, so it's pre-made. And then I have a em rather empty app.js uh, file that only initializes my Ember application. And then I have an, a, a template, uh, which just prints out uh, a header. So I'll be making changes to the, to the app and the templates directory, and the rest of the directories will just stay as they are. So I can close them. So at the moment, the app looks like this. I can tell that Ember is loaded because it, uh, the debug version of Ember will print out some debug messages. And in addition, I get a header out here, or a text down on the page. Um, so the first thing which I generally want to do is just to uh, add a header. So I can go into my application.handlebars file, uh, and I'll just remove this. And then I'll, I want to put my header in a separate handlebars templates, uh, generally because there tend to be some logic there, and I want to have that in a separate place so it's easy to find. So I'll use the handlebars expression render. So any handlebars expression is started and ended with double curly braces. So there's an expression called render, and that will uh, render a template, and it will also generate a default controller and a default view. So I'll just call that a header. So this here expects that I have a file called, or a template named header. So if I refresh my app, um, sorry. I should be getting an error. Uh, you used the render header, but header cannot be found, either as a template or as a view. So in order to fix that, I will create a new uh, file, and I'll call it header.hps. The ending of the file can be anything. It could be text or HTML, or uh, generally, handlebars templates has the ending hps. I generally used HTML uh, before, because uh, WebStorm didn't automatically color code my uh, uh, HPS files. Um, so it's just a text file. And in here I'll uh, add a div. Uh, I'll, the ID of that div will be a header area. And in here I'll just uh, I'll put an image. Uh, uh, images. So, so if I refresh, I'll uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll get a header out, which is rather simple at the moment. Um, but on the left here, we had a list of buckets. So I'll just explain um, the reason why it's sorry. Um, it uses LevelDB as the as the database to store the data, um, but the, um, the structure is sort of like uh, the React has it. So you can have a bucket, and the bucket can have a bunch of keys, and that's sort of the the two abstraction layers that React has. 
Uh, but it, since React is a pain to get up and running locally, uh, I sort of made a backend that resembles that. Um, yeah. So on the on the left hand side here, we'll uh, render all of our buckets. So we'll start out by creating a uh, folder under app. We'll just call that buckets. And under here, we'll create a JavaScript file called buckets uh, route.js. Uh, and then we'll create a, um, a route for our buckets route. So our application namespace is ldbb. I'm just going to say buckets route equals ember.route.extend. So this is good so far. Um, but we want to load some data into our, into our buckets route. And the route has a hook called model, uh, which is a function. And inside here we can create some data. So we'll start out by just creating a, an array called buckets, which is an empty array. And we'll return that array. And then we'll just add some dummy data. So I'll say buckets <coughs> dot push object, and I'll create an, a new ember. <coughs> sorry, a new ember object. Uh, create. So this is how we normally extend and create classes in Ember. So if you want to extend the functionality and create <coughs> a new a new class, you use the keyword dot extend. And if you want to create a new instance of a class, you use the dot create. And the reason for this is that once, when you do this, Ember will set up any bindings and observers and <coughs> functionality that Ember needs in order to, to be able to propagate your changes out to your views, as well as other stuff. Uh, so in this uh, object, we'll just have an ID, and we'll call it bucket1. And then I'll just create two more, called bucket2 and bucket3. So now we want to create a, uh, a template to render something on the screen. So we'll create a template here called um, buckets.hps. Uh, and in here we'll start by uh, adding a header. We just name it buckets. And then we want to iterate over our models. And we can do that by using the each handlebars helper. Uh, and we'll just say, um, buckets in controller, which is the easiest way to say that I want to iterate over all the models in my buckets controller, and I want to name each variable buckets. So in here we'll create a simple div, and we'll just output the buckets.id, which is the ID of each bucket. But so far we haven't actually created our route, so we need to uh, define the buckets route as well. So we'll create a, a new file called um, route.js uh, and we'll say ldbb.router.map which is the uh, which is the, the way uh, or the name <laughs> which is how uh, the router is defined so in here I'll say this.resource I'll call it buckets and I'll have a path of slash, as well as a function for any subroutes, which will be empty at this point. Uh, yeah, and this is the function. Like so. And the reason why I need to define the path uh, as slash is that the name of the, uh, the route or the resource is buckets. So if I didn't have this path declaration here, the URL would be slash buckets, which is always the name of the resource. So hopefully I can refresh my application here and it doesn't show anything. And the reason for this is, is that we haven't told Ember where to render our application sub-templates. So to do that, we need to go back into the uh, application handlebars uh, template and we'll just create a uh, div with an ID of 
main area, and then we'll use the expression outlet. And that basically tells that whenever you reach this point, this is where I want any uh, sub routes to be rendered into the DOM. Um, and I should explain as well, um, some expressions have a pound, like so, and some do not. Uh, the ones that doesn't are just simple expressions that doesn't have contents, or we can't define the contents. Whereas the other, the ones that have a pound, uh, they're block expressions, so they can have contents, and they will be end, um, terminated with a slash. Should be sort of familiar. Uh, Oh, there we go. Just didn't refresh. Well, refresh it. Refreshed it before uh, Grunt was finished his work. So now we we list get to list uh, the buckets that are there. But it doesn't really look that good. So we'll add some uh, Bootstrap uh, magic. So we'll go back into the buckets handlebars file, and then we'll add a a div just up here with the class of uh, list group. <coughs> And then we'll create a class of list group item for each of the items. So that should look a little bit better. But now what we want though is we want to be able to click on any of these and navigate into the subroute for, for that bucket. So just before we do that, we will we, um, we'll connect the server side. So we can go back to our uh, buckets route. And instead of doing all of all of this manual labor here, you can call into Ember Data. So we'll, we'll, we'll return uh, this dot store, uh, and Ember will automatically inject the um, uh, Ember uh, data into each route and each controller via the store property. Then we can say find and the name of our uh, model, which is going to be buckets. Um, yeah, but we don't have a model for our bucket yet, so we need to create one. So we'll create a uh, a new uh, file called buckets, uh, and it'll be ldbb dot bucket equals, and then Ember Data has the namespace ds, and we will be extending the model uh, object. Uh, and if we look back to the JSON, we can see that each bucket has an ID, sorry, an ID and a set of keys. So at the moment we don't have a key object, so we don't want we don't need to map them yet. And the ID is inferred by Ember, and actually it's uh, it has to be implicit, so that if I actually explicitly define an ID, Ember Data will complain and say that the ID is already defined. So at this point, we should be able to refresh, and then, <laughs> yeah, and then it says it goes. If you look at the URL, it's hard to see, but it goes to slash buckets, and if you remember, remember from the slide, the URL is slash JSON slash buckets, and the reason I put this is that generally my app has the same uh, sort of URL scheme as my backend does. So I want buckets to be named buckets both in my client and in my server application. And in order for my server side to be able to generate or to serve uh, the application for the actual buckets URL and not the data and vice versa, I've, uh, I generally serve my data with a different URL. So in order to be able to override this, I need to go back into uh, my application and tell Ember Data that I need to namespace my, uh, my uh, API. So I'll just do this in app.js instead of creating a new file. And in here I'll say um, <coughs> ds.rest adapter, which is the adapter, one of the adapters that Ember Data ships with. I'm gonna, just going to reopen it. And I'm going to say namespace equals json. And hopefully that will be all I need. No. 
Yeah, and then I need to tell my app to use it as well. So that I need to create a, create a store. So I'll do ldb.store equals ds.store.extend. And I'm going to tell it which adapter to use. And this is going to be a string, and it's this string here, or the name of the adapter. And it's like that as well. Um, yeah, so there I get some data. This is just random <laughs> artist from my iTunes uh, library. Um, so now I want to be able to click here and navigate into a sub route called buckets. So I'll go into my code. I'll go into the, the route uh, definition. I'm going to define a sub route called buckets. So resource buckets, and that's going to have a path. And the difference between the buckets um, resource and the bucket resource is that the bucket resource has a dynamic part, and that is the, um, in this case, the bucket you've selected. So I want the path here to be slash buckets, and then slash the ID of that bucket. And you can say bucket underscore ID. And then also has a function, which is any subroutes. Um, so now I will be I should be able to go into my I'm sorry my buckets um, template and I'll replace this div with a link uh, and uh, Ember has a link helper called or handlebars has a link helper called uh, link to uh, and that takes the name of the resource or route you want to navigate into so in this case uh, buckets. And you can also send it a content or a context. And in this case, this is the bucket that we clicked on. So that's also named uh, bucket from on up in the each helper. Uh, and in addition to make uh, Twitter Bootstrap happy with the CSS classes, I'll just add uh, the class definition here. And then inside here, I'll still just print out bucket.id. So now we should be able to reload and click on an item. Nothing really happens in the user interface, but as you see, the URL up here updates as I select the route. And that means that I can select a route and I can refresh, and the user will come back to the application right away. And the reason why it takes a while before the page shows, <laughs> it's because I've added to the back end. For each call, I'm added a one second sleep. Uh, and we'll come back to why that is, but it's just so that because everything happens instantly when everything else on a local machine, so it's just a simulator, slow network. Uh, so the next thing here, we want to this buckets uh, uh, area takes up the whole width of the page, so we just want to make sure that it only takes up the left hand side. Uh, so we'll do that in here as well. We'll create a uh, div um, <coughs> with a class of row, which is Twitter Bootstrap. Uh, classes, and we'll create a, uh, a div inside here, which are have a class of uh, call md4. Uh, so Twitter Bootstrap has twelve columns in its setup. Uh, so in addition to these four columns, I just need to create the other eight, and then I'll move this code here inside the first here, and I move the I'm going to move the header as well inside of here. Uh, so hopefully it'll look a little bit better on the way we anticipated. So now we can move on to actually showing the content of the bucket on the right hand side here. So let's start with creating the model. <coughs> so I'll create a uh, JavaScript file called um, oh, sorry, uh, no, we actually don't need to do that yet. Um, if you look at the route, we have a bucket, or a, sorry, a resource called buckets. Uh, so we'll we'll uh, create a um, bucket route and a bucket handlebars template. So we create a folder in here called buckets. You don't need to create folders for uh, for your code, but it makes it a lot simpler to find them later. Uh, so generally, I structure the, uh, the my code in the same way as I structure my router. 
uh, bucket route but yes and also the name of the files doesn't matter it's just uh, I can read the name of the file and I can know where I am in my application from just the file name which is handy so I'll create a uh, bucket uh, route and that also extends uh, ember route <coughs> And in here, I'll also be overriding the model hook, or model function. Uh, and the difference here is that in our route, we had a dynamic part here. So in our uh, route class, we also get uh, a variable passed into this function. So in here, we can then say uh, return, and this.store.find again. And this is also a bucket, and then we can pass in an ID. So if you don't have a, a second parameter to find, it will go to the server and ask for all of the buckets. If you pass in an ID, it will ask the server for a single bucket. Um, so this will be buckets, and then it'll be whatever, sorry, um, whatever name you gave it here. So it'll be bucket underscore ID in this case. Uh, and now we can create a um, bucket template. Um, uh, and in here we'll just start out by um, writing out the ID of whatever bucket we are in. So in addition to that we need to also tell where our buckets route should render any sub templates, which is in this uh, eight span call column here. So do that with outlet, and now this should show which bucket we've selected here. Uh, but below here, we want to show the list of keys that that bucket has. So in order to do that, we need to create a model called keys, and we need to um, set up the relationship between bucket and keys so Denver can find them. Uh, so we'll then create a uh, file called buckets.js. Oh, oh, we created it. Sorry. <laughs> it's already there. Uh, keys. Thank you. So we call that key.js and we'll call the class uh, ldbb.key and that also will extend uh, sorry, ds.model and this model has a little bit more information uh, so if you look at the JSON it has an ID in addition it has the name of the bucket the name of the key as well as a value which is just a string so the ID is already mapped for us so we need to create a bucket name uh, property and then we need to define, we need to tell Ember Data what type of property is this. Is it a string? Is it a number? Is it a boolean? Uh, so we'll do that by saying ds.atter. Just somehow got, came, uh, this is sort of standard between all the persistent frameworks and that you use .adder to define what type of uh, attribute it is. So this is a string. And then we have a key name, which is also a string. And then we had value, which is also a string. So now we want to create a re relationship between our bucket and our key model. So we'll go back into uh, the bucket, and then we'll create a um, property called keys. And then we need to tell uh, Ember Data that we this is a one-to-many relationship. So keys has uh, many, and in here we need to put to tell it. Uh, which um, which other object or which other model is this referring to? So this is key, and then we also need to tell it if are we uh, when we load our keys. Oh, sorry, when we load our buckets from the server, are we also going to load uh, or return all of our keys that belong to that bucket, or are that going to be an asynchronous uh, fetch? And in our case, it is. So we need to tell it that this is an async. I think uh, true. So 
So the default is false, and you need to explicitly tell it that this is an async relationship. Um, and there's no semicolon. Uh, so then we should be able to go back into our uh, uh, bucket um, template and then iterate over our over the keys in our in our bucket. Uh, so we'll have the same structure. So I'll just copy these. This will be uh, six because they're going to be uh, taking half of the space that's left over in the in the on the page. And there's going to be another another one of these. So inside of this first uh, column, I'm going to print out the the header, and then I'm going to iterate over each of my keys. So I can say key in keys, and keys here is then referring to the bucket keys property. Uh, like so, and then in here I can print out the keys. So then I need a, a, my list group uh, here as well. Class equals list group. Uh, and in here I'm gonna do the same thing. Uh, so we start with a div uh, with a class of list group item, and then in here we'll print out the key and uh, the name of the key so key dot key name so that refers to sorry refers to this property inside key here so at this point hopefully we should be able to refresh and hasman is not defined <laughs> um, DS dot has many. Um, yeah, so it takes a second to load because the server uh, adds a second delay. So at this point, we will we will list each of the um, each of the albums that each of these artists has, or at least some of them. But when we refresh, it takes a second before any, anything happens. So that's not really that user friendly. So we'll just let's add a, a loading indicator. And uh, in Ember one dot two, they added a, a default sub uh, sub route called loading that you can override uh, in order to override this behavior here. Uh, so we'll just create a a, a template here called uh, loading. Uh, and the reason for it being in the top directory here is that it, it it's uh, the sub route for the the top level resource buckets. Um, so we can have another one for if we had uh, later we'll add one for bucket as well, and we're going to add that in inside a folder called bucket, so we can separate out the loading indicators. Um, so I'll just type out loading for now. Uh, and that should be all I need to do in order to get the page to say that it's actually performing an action. Um, so let's make it look a little bit more... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'll just see if I can find the, um, the HTML for the Twitter loading, bootstrap loading indicator. So, um, but we'll be having multiple loading indicators, so it doesn't really make sense to have to define them in multiple places in our application. They are going to look fairly the same. So what we'll do, we'll create a component that has our loading indicator. And we'll do that by creating a directory called components. And in here we create a, a template called uh, loading-indicator.hps. I need any components in Ember needs to have a dash in them uh, to be compatible with ECMAScript's uh, six uh, web components. 
so that it, you don't have to change all the code when, when that becomes available. So in here we'll create a div, and then it has a class, uh, which is progress, uh, progress, right, and then it has another div uh, with a class of progress bar, <laughs> progress bar success, which is makes it green. Um, and then it has a role of progress bar, and then it has an area value now equals something, we'll say 40, and area value min equals 0, and area value max equals 100 and then we'll just make it so that it fills the whole area so it says style equals with 100 percent um, yeah and this takes a span class sorry ah thanks Uh, which is SR only, and it takes some text. So, uh, what Ember will do now when it boots our uh, Ember application is that it will find any templates that are uh, hash um, components slash at the start of the name, and the name will be derived from the folder they live in, and it will create a component. And what that does, it will create um, a, a template or we will use the template of with the same name as our uh, handlebars template. So we will create a component called loading dash indicator, and it will also create a handlebars uh, sorry, an, um, a custom handlebars expression, so we can access ex access it directly. So now we can replace this loading here with uh, loading indicator. So that makes it pretty simple to create new components and to have components that are re reusable. Uh, and components are also um, not, uh, they won't um, inherit controllers or views uh, from where they are defined, so they'll, each component will have their own sort of, uh, they'll be self-contained. So if we refresh now, hopefully, we'll get a, um, um, at least we'll get a, uh, a loading indicator, but we really we wanted it to be inside the, the same area as the buckets because that's the loading in that's where the loadicator, loading indicator lives. So inside of our loading here, we'll just uh, for now we'll just fake it. We'll just say class equals uh, row, and then div class equals call md4. And then we'll put the loading indicator inside there. And then hopefully it'll look a little bit better. Um, so we'll see how far we can get in 10 minutes. So now we want to be able to select. Uh, well, actually, uh, it'll be exactly the same as we did so far. So let's do some something else that are a bit more interesting. Uh, let's add some code to add a new bucket to our system. So we'll uh, go into our. Um, uh, buckets uh, handlebars file, and then just underneath here, we'll create a button. So the button will be class equals btn, btn default to color it white, and it'll say add buckets. So now, uh, whenever we click this button here, we want to perform an action. Do this with the action helper. And that has a name, so we'll call it uh, add bucket. And we can also send in a context, but in this case we don't have a context to send in, so we'll just uh, we won't have a third parameter to the action. So that means we can either add uh, an action to our route, a buckets route or buckets controller. And generally, I, I like to add my actions that are not data bound to my controller and any data bound 
actions that sort of needs to call on the um, on the model layer in the in the route. So then I'll add um, a file called sorry a JavaScript file called buckets controller. Um, so it's called buckets controller, and that's going to inherit from an Ember controller. So there's three types of controllers. There's uh, controller, which is just a normal controller with no con uh, with no contents. There's an object controller, which is a proxy for a single object, and there's an array controller, which is a proxy for an array. And since we have an array of buckets here, we're going to extend the array controller. Don't extend. Uh, and then we can create an action, an actions uh, hash, or an object, or an action hash, like that. And then we need to name our action, which is add bucket, and that's the function. So in here we need to do to uh, have enough code to be able to tell our view to show uh, something where we can input the name of our bucket. Um, so we'll just say this dot set, which is uh, Ember has get getters and setters for everything. So we can't do just dot to be able, able to get and set properties. And the reason for that is that Ember will know whatever you, whenever your data is dirty, it knows that, so we can act upon that and propagate uh, bindings, or it knows that your models are dirty and so forth. So we're just going to set a property on our controller. We're just going to call it um, uh, show add buckets. I'm going to set that to true. So back in our um, handlebars expression, uh, <laughs> handlebars template, uh, we can now use an if and say if show bucket view. No, show add buckets. <laughs> uh, we want to do something, and if not, we want to do something else. So typically, we want to show this button uh, by default. And then whenever, when you click the button, we want to show something else. Uh, and what we want to show here is a we'll make it simple. Is it an input field? So we we'll create an input type equals uh, text. So I can either do it like that with a handlebars expression, or I can use the standard HTML input tag and then bind my properties uh, that way. But it's a lot easier to just use the uh, built-in handlebars expression. So the type equals text, and the value of that is a value on my controller, and I'll just call it new bucket mm -hmm. bucket name, uh, like so, and then I want to add a button, and uh, we will call save. And we want to add another one called cancel. So seven minutes, we should be able to do it. <laughs> um, so if I refresh now, there's a bucket button up here, which I can press, and it'll replace my view with my form, or with my form inputs. And I need to fix that. Um, so yeah, if you use... Um, Quotes, it'll be interpreted as a string, but I want to bind it to my to this property on my controller, so I don't use. I need to omit the quotes, uh, and then I need to call actions on these. So this will be action, action, uh, and it'll be save bucket, and and this one will be. Uh, Cancel buckets. Not the best names, but. Uh, so in our buckets controller, we can add these uh, functions save bucket. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, cancel buckets. So in these uh, two functions, we want to do the inverse of. Of this, we want to whenever you click either of these buttons, you want to show the form again, or the, sorry, the bucket again. Uh, and in here, we, we want to actually persist our model. So what we can do here is say this dot sorry, this dot store 
dot um, create record. So we need to create a new record of type buckets. We need to provide you some data. So in our case, we we only have an idea of the name of the of the um, uh, the name of the um, bucket. So we'll say um, id equals this. Dot, sorry. Uh, first, we need to get create a variable with our with the name. So we'll say bucket name equals this dot get, and this in this context context is the controller. So we can say uh, new bucket name, and in here we can do like that. So we'll <laughs> so this will return a new object for us. So we need to do, um, to put that in our variable, or we don't need to, but we can. And then we need to save it, and that's simply in uh, in uh, Ember data. It's the model name and dot save. And that will persist our data onto our uh, server, and uh, depending on the um, HTTP status code you get in return, uh, Ember Data knows if it's okay or if it's in an error state or similar. So hopefully, yeah. And in addition here, uh, I want to do. I don't. Sorry. Um, yeah, and then I'll just want to reset my. Uh, my bucket name to an empty string or a null. The ID yes. Thank you. So hopefully now we'll be able to refresh. And we can go in here and we can type some stuff. And we can click cancel to do nothing. Or we can persist it. So we'll call it new bucket and save. And it Ooh. Yeah, there's a bug on my uh, server side. We'll fix that. Well, we won't fix that, but it doesn't matter. So we can refresh here, and you can see that it's been added on our server side. But as you can see as well, uh, when we type something in here and type save, it's added immediately. Um, and what we really want to do is we want to add it whenever it's uh, returned from the server. So all of the functions in Ember Data uh, returns a promise. So here I can say then, uh, which is takes a function. This is a standard uh, sort of promise implementation. Uh, and this will we'll get some data in return. And when this happens, I'm, this is where I really want to, um, to reset my uh, the new bucket name and uh, show the bucket in the, or hide the form, like so. So if I go back now and type something else, uh, it should take a little while. Yeah, and it yeah sorry because the server fails, it doesn't work uh, because it goes in an error state. Error state. So there's two there's two callbacks here. The first one is success, and the second one is failure. So in this case here, we could add could have added a second function here. And uh, say something uh, or something. Could you add this part call a template stuff or a, a component? Yeah, yeah. So you could bring up a component that says. Uh, uh, so you, you might get a, a red error message up here saying that something went wrong or something. Uh, okay, I'm out of time. I have one minute left, so. I guess we can take a few questions if anyone has any. Yeah. How big is a typical Ember application? Uh, what do you mean in uh, you kilobytes? Mean like a client just need to download a lot of data before. Uh, I think uh, GCP. Yeah. Uh, how large is the Ember framework in size in kilobytes? So I think it is about 240 kilobytes compressed. So it is quite a large framework, but again, uh, most sites have images that are way over 250 uh, kilobytes. Uh, but you do get a lot of functionality out of it. And once you get rolling, uh, the separation between the client and the server, in my mind, is worth that amount of kilobytes.
Any other questions? What, what did the promise, you said the promise uh, actually give you had a then and... What yeah, so the promise has... Uh, yeah, the promise has two, uh, uh, two callbacks. The first one is success and the second one is fail. So if, um, if uh, at least in Amadata, if you get a 200 error code or a 200 status code back, it'll call the success uh, callback and in any other case it'll call a fail callback. Would there be any delay or um, time of waiting for the I don't know if there's a standard delay. I think you might have to. Yeah, um, I don't think there is. I mean, I, I've built applications that are, that have really slow servers that are in that order, and that works fine. Yeah. Can you uh, delay the display uh, rendering of things if you want to wait for a certain yeah so yeah of actions to happen before you flicker the UI. You can, and uh, this is one way to do it. And another way would be, so if I'm in, in here, if I only wanted to show uh, the buckets that are loaded properly, I could go and say if bucket dot is loaded, uh, and that wouldn't show, sorry, and that wouldn't show any buckets that are new or, uh, and I think this would even hide buckets that are uh, in transit and stuff. But you could implement uh, logic to do that. Yeah, thank you.